getting back into playing music in Bakersfield, there were so many people who were like, you know, it was a sellout. Bakersfield hates on other Bakersfield people who have success. It's the strangest place in the planet, and believe you me, I've been everywhere on this planet, and Bakersfield is the strangest place on the planet, <laughs> hands down. There's so many different kinds of like scenes here and people and things going on. It's a big mixture of all kinds of stuff. I love it. It's a dark vibe. I've always said that this is a living David Lynch film. I think people in Bakersfield have a chip on their shoulder or there's a toughness about the town. Um, Maybe even back to the Bakersfield sound thing as far as uh, something to prove. Uh, they're very blue collar, uh, agricultural. Um, I've found, you know, from concerts to, to the racing scene, we'll go with other people from Bakersfield. We were text games one year and didn't even get in the gate before. There was already like an eight on eight person fight, you know, and I was like, are we really that Bakersfield? We can't even like attend this without having a fight. You couldn't bump into somebody in Bakersfield without seriously trying to prevent violence happening. I mean, it's a violence. Yeah, I mean, like, and even if you're, hey man, I'm sorry. The industries that we have in the area, you know, we're very focused on ag and oil and gas. I mean, those are really the predominant uh, industries in the area. And, and it's hard work. There's always been a, a certain amount of I guess machismo in, in, in those industries. Bakersfield's very strange. Yeah, if you don't learn how to use it to your advantage, you definitely sink fast. It is the biggest small town that I've ever experienced. You can get away for a little bit, but most of the time, you're gonna come right back. The people in Bakersfield really don't like Bakersfield. <laughs> so they make jokes about Bakersfield. It's almost like you have ageism, you have racism, this is townism. It is like a small version of Texas. Like Texas is all about, you know, gun rights and four by fours and, you know, just the whole country living. And that's what kind of like Bakersfield seems like to me. It's a tough town to grow up in, but I think a lot of us had to find a place and something to be involved in. Not all of us were athletes and stuff. Um, those of us who are musicians had to find a place, something outside of all the, the bullshit that we were putting up with. I feel like Bakersfield is like a microcosm of big city counterculture. It's just all different types of people involved, different genres of music, psychobilly, rockabilly, punk rockers, skaters. You know, the whole group, everybody together, all like just trying to go off and have a good time. People think that people in Bakersfield are really mean, and they're not. As long as you can find your weird crowd, you can get along and you can survive even though it's 100, you know, 20,000 degrees or you know, it's uh, sometimes it's hard to get a job if you're not a uh, you know oil person or if you're artsy or you're a little outside. But if you have your, your tribe of people, you'll get you'll get around. And I mean, I've seen my friends succeed and do really well here because th we're very supportive. Once you like somebody here, like they're yours for life.
Chester Avenue in the late 80s, early 90s was, man, now you're bringing back just some crazy time, sitting on the side, yelling at bitches, on, you know, just screaming at them, hey, come park and drink some beer with us, or, you know, going, taking off from here, cruising all the way from the circle, you know, just north of us, all the way down to Brundage Lane, uh, doing the circle and just stopping, seeing everybody, all the cars, the low riders, the mini trucks, uh, bikes in the middle of the street, you know, it was just mayhem. When I was in high school, or finishing up high school, there was really no crossover of any genres. You either had the cowboys, you had the cholos, the blacks, you know, the rockers and the punkers. So, you know, the only time anybody really got together in a setting that was, you know, mixed up was like everybody would cruise Chester in their hot rods or low riders. And, you know, the city ended up taking that away. But what was really cool is we had a studio. And there was a studio where like glam bands and stuff all practiced on the corner of uh, Chester and uh, 20th Street. And, uh, you know, we'd sit out there after band practice and watch all these cars go by. And then there would be fights, of course, and, you know, one alternative, you know, which was known as the gay bar was around the corner, and people would turn around and keep the crews would have to drive by the gay bar, and they would throw, like, the cowboys would throw fruit, you know, whatever they were throwing out in the field. If you were into punk rock, you were a faggot, and if you were into heavy metal with long hair, you were a faggot. Anything that that was other than cowboy or jock, you were a faggot. The kids wanted it fast, loud, aggressive, and so you had the heavy metal, you had the punk, and that because that's who was here, younger people, you know, and uh, no knock against them, it's just that was, and so that was kind of the scene, and with that scene, of course, creates tensions and some fighting and violence. Being young and growing up in Bakersfield, there was not a heck of a lot to do. We found ourselves partying on the panorama bluffs overlooking the oil fields, drinking a case of Coors Light, or standing ankle deep in cow shit in the pastures south of town at Pumpkin Center, listening to punk rock, suicidal tendencies on a ghetto blaster in the middle of nowhere. It was a lot of fun. Occasionally a good show would come through once in the Blue Moon, TSOL, RKL. Rich kids on LSD. And that band, I believe, took the whole show. I mean, that was a great show. I was a small little room with glass. I just remember glass being against the wall in that room. You know, there it was not set up. It looked more like a dance studio than an actual place to have a gig, you know? <laughs> First show I ever saw was Black Flag at Vidal's. I was 15 years old. My stepfather went with me. I got to see Henry Rollins, you know. Henry Rollins at that point was in his his uh, boxers and no, you know, no shirt, no shoes. What is this? You know, so, uh, when, where it was at that point on on Union was a great place to watch shows. It was it was dark down there. It was you know what I mean. There was there was just a huge pit. And me being 15 years old, and I took my stepdad. And my stepdad still to this day. We walked down there with his baseball jersey on, you know, like, what in the hell is this, you know? God dang, what are these guys doing to each other? And then Janelle Satterfield, I remember her, she was going around the outside, like, running around the pit, and just kind of clubbed my stepdad. It was great. There was a place called Roller Town. It was a roller disco, and I probably spent uh, at least two, two nights a week there as a kid. It was in the decline. By 1984, it was completely run down and kids weren't roller skating anymore. So they decided to have bands play. And they were having a local band night. And um, it was the first time I'd been there since I was a little kid. And uh, they still had the disco balls on the, wall, on the ceiling and stuff. And uh, it was very sad to see. So they had a bunch of local bands play, local punk bands. And I went and with some friends, and um, it was that mid '80s hardcore era of punk where everything was just thrash, 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 thrash. Reagan sucks. Reagan sucks. And that was never my scene. I was more like in the Sex Pistols and that kind of stuff. I saw one of the last bands putting their gear on stage, and there was this guy 
It was a trio, and this guy stood out to me because um, he's kind of a big, chubby guy. He had a cowboy hat, a string tie thing, some overalls, and he's carrying a uh, fluorescent green guitar. And I told my friend, so let me just check out a couple songs by this band. Because I'd never seen them before, I didn't know who they were. They looked interesting. They play, and their music was very strange. Um, it was like a mix of every single genre of music you could think of. There was punk, there was country, there was heavy metal, there was jazz, there was funk. There was classical, bits of classical. And the music would start and then stop and start and stop. And um, it was crazy. I, I couldn't believe it. these were local guys. I kind of approached the band to talk to them, but I was too shy. So I just kind of went up and said, hey, you guys are great. And they're like, thanks, whatever. And that was the first time I ever heard or saw a big jet. Punk rock in the 80s was fucking kick ass. It was very violent. That's what I remember. I never even the fucking cameraman was violent. Be up front, get fucking elbow, and fucking what the fuck is that all about? You know what I mean? The pit um, is the most amazing thing I've ever experienced as far as like being able to get my aggressions out. Because when I was younger, I didn't have that. Then I got to the scene, and I'm like, yes, this is the best thing ever, for real. Just going in there, just let loose, just, I mean, like Paul can get all your aggression out. At the same time, if someone falls down or, I mean, pick them up, a fight starts, stop that shit, because we don't need it to, I mean, cause more trouble. We're trying to have fun. I mean, have fun, but have unity, and if we need to kick the shit out of someone and kick them out of here, so be it. My dad ran the American Legion Hall, so it was easy for me to throw shows there until there was a two you know, uh, homeless people raped another homeless girl about 10 blocks away from, from that show, but the newspaper put it as big rape at American Legion Hall punk rock show. So we ended up having to go to Solomon Juarez. At the time, you had to, I probably still knew how to get uh, amplified music permit and an occupancy permit to do all that stuff. You'd have to have a business license and apply for the permits and that stuff. So. Every two or three shows, we would have to change our name and, and put somebody else in the lead and kind of disguise them to go in there and, <laughs> you know, hey, I've got this company and do a little show. And they oh, what type of music is it? Oh, it's contemporary rock, you know, real family style stuff. And, uh, we'd have to change the name of the, of the companies all the time. They'd catch on right away and two or three shows down the road, pretty soon they'd be not denying our permits every time again. They didn't want that type of music in Bakersfield at that time, so it was it was difficult. I checked out this this little hall, and uh, you know, a little sign on it, hall for rent. And kind of tripped out because it was by the train tracks and CD, you know, Baker Street. A lot of homeless around, so I called them up. It was two hundred and fifty dollars. I was like, two hundred and fifty dollars, and it fits eight hundred people. Okay, so uh, I got Pacific West Sound and. Got the mentors to come down for two hundred dollars, and because you know they were my buds, and uh, we had a complete blowout. And then from there on, everybody kind of jumped on the bandwagon, and that was the spot. I remember, you know, Motley Crue in '86, Vince Neil getting hit with that beer bottle. I mean, it was just iconic. I mean, I was 14 years old, and just watch this big fucking rock star just cry off like a little baby. There was a show. 1985, thrown by uh, my buddy Dan Kites at a place called Poncho's, which ended up being La Movida. During the show, uh, Kyle, singer for Dr. Nose, it was him, Ishmael Hernandez, and the original drummer, I can't remember his name, the left-handed guy. They got in kind of this argument with one of the members of the Eight Ballers, and Chotty was his name. And Chotty and his friends ended up beating the shit out of Dr. No, you know, and, you know, they had to come come back and get their gear later, and, you know, and that, that kind of stuff happened where, like, Mad Parade, I threw a show at the American Legion Hall, and uh, Efren Lopez socked the singer up and did some other stuff to him, and Efren was a big guy, and the singer of Mad Parade is like some junky-looking L.A. dude, you know, all pale and frail, you know. And that would just constantly happen at every show we, you know, threw. And, and like, there was like 
no shows. And then finally a year, year and a half, they'd let us have one. Same ridiculous fights, same, you know, like I said, they tried to pin a rape on the Hyrax XL show with Final Conflict. That was bums, you know, half a mile away getting it on. The Deftones, I mean, they won't come to Bakersfield ever again because they've gotten ran off by, I don't know if I should mention names or whatnot, but, you know. So there's a reason why the Deftones won't be here anymore, but, uh, did they? When did they come back? Uh, about five years ago. The Deftones, they got beat up here, you know. Guilty of that one right there, but, you know, this, this is not a place you come and, and try to be shit if you're not, you know, especially from this town, because the, the, the community of the friends back in that time were, were tight, you know. Everybody still has each other's back, so it was, it was cool, you know. But uh, you definitely did not come here and fuck around with the, the local natives, you know. <laughs> I can't remember who got beat up, and then in Max and Rock and Roll and that, real, don't play big, so there was no punk bands, no, there was no gigs for two years, from 86 until I had the show in 88. With uh, Bulimia Banquet, and then Circle One was supposed to play, then the singer got DOI, killed somebody, so he was in jail. That's how I met Exotoxins, Dean, then he was in Schlepp Rock and all that shit for a long time, so I had the first show in two years. I got in a car accident, he was that money to throw, throw a show at the West Jeffries up on Union. That was, uh, fuck, that was fun. That was, I never got my deposit back, but I'll tell you that. I'm thinking in my head, how dark in the 80s, like, fuck, man, I'm not supposed to remember it. That's how good That's how good of a time it was, you know? Because honestly, I don't. We all seem to have a, a similar story of some kind of uh, troubles uh, or something dysfunctional that made us complete, like, the land of misfit toys. Um, and to this day, I still, like, hold, I hold, I cherish all those relationships um, and proud to say it's, it's made me who I am today. I wanted to be in a band so bad, my soul ached to just be in a band, all I wanted to do. I kicked around in a couple of small bands but nothing ever became of it, it was just garage stuff but I would play guitar at home, practice, occasionally I would run into the drummer of Big Jed at school, his name is Paul Birch. I heard a rumor that Big Jed were about to go on tour and they were about to get signed to an uh, independent label called Triple X and their bass player just left. And I thought, this is my chance. I've got to get into that band. So the next day I saw Paul and I went up to him and I said, hey, I heard you need a bass player. He said, yeah, yeah, our bass player just moved away. And I said, I'm your guy. And he was like, yeah, we'll set up, uh, give me your number, we'll set up a audition and you can try out. In my head, I'm imagining he had 10 other guys that they were gonna audition. So not only am I the worst person to have in a band, I did not have a car, I didn't even have a bass, I didn't have an amp. I could play the bass, but like I said, I could bang out some Ramon songs. I take the tape home and I play it and the music is so complicated and so hard. It's super catchy, super hooky, really different. Like I said, all different kinds of genres. I borrowed a bass from a friend and I practiced and I practiced. This was my goal was to get in a band. I didn't care about getting a job or an education. I just wanted to be in a band, travel the country, live like a pirate. I could fake my way through a few of the songs. And um, Paul calls me and I thought we were gonna set up an audition or something to try out, and he tells me, hey, we're taking band pictures for the album. Do you want to uh, come and take a picture? And I was like, huh? Uh, what do you mean? He said, yeah, we need, a, a, our label needs a, a band promo picture. And I was like, uh, okay, where? And he said, oh, we're gonna be downtown. I was like, okay, I'll, I'll be there. So we take this picture. I had not played one single note with the band. They put me in the promo picture. Paul tells me, by the way, we put your name on the record. And I was like, you put my name on the record? I, I didn't play on it. I haven't even played with you guys. You guys don't even know if I know how to play. I don't even own a bass. I'm like, well, whatever.
my brother played guitar, and uh, I, I I loved watching. I just loved watching him play, and I really wanted to learn. And uh, so he'd show me a few things. He'd show me some chords, and and uh, finally, finally, uh, he just said, "You know what? You seem to want the guitar more than I do." So he just gave it to me. And I said, I, I see how I just said you already really want to learn. So it's, uh, it's, I think this will be better in your hands. So he gave this to me, and I think it was 77 or 78. And uh, this is what I learned to play on. You know? it's just a, it's an Orpheus or something, I don't know what it is. But, uh, but I love this, I love this guitar. I mean, I, I, I won't give it up. What influenced me was uh, listening to Kiss Alive. And just like everybody else my age, uh, we all wanted to be Ace Frehley. That's what I wanted to do. I, 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 at that point, I said to myself, I want to play guitar. I want to, I want to do this. I want to do what they're doing. I think as a child, I, even, I enjoyed the darker, the darker things, you know, movies, music. Listening to, to bands, like I said, listening to bands like The Cure, Killing Joke, Christian Death especially. Christian Death was a big influence on me. I don't know, I, I, I just really enjoyed, I, I, well, I don't know about enjoy, but I really liked the darker sounds, the darker themes, and just the, the, the overall attitude. And at the time it seemed like uh, the Death Rock scene in LA it just it seemed genuine. It, it really seemed genuinely creepy. <laughs> We're talking about early 80s where we didn't have we didn't have internet. We didn't have that kind of that kind of quick response, you know, communication with promoters and stuff. So you, you really you actually had to go and meet these people, you know, and, and, and create this relationship with them. We just pushed our 45 on the promoters. That's what got us on the shows. Playing in San Francisco with Dead Kennedys, that was, uh, uh, Paul and Joe went to KXLU, I think, in Berkeley, and they uh, had a rough cassette of final, The Final Conflict. And uh, they played it on the, uh, I believe it was a Maximum Rock and Roll uh, program with uh, Timmy Han. They were playing it, and I guess Jello was in the, in the joining uh, studio. And he came out, he liked what he heard, and he said, Who, who's this playing? And Joe popped up and said, it's my man, Burning Image. And uh, I guess they exchanged numbers, and not long after that, he called and uh, asked us to open the show, Butthole Surfers and MIA and Dead Kennedys. I think what I liked about Bakersfield at that time, everybody was really starting to explore new types of music and stuff. You know, you had Big Jed, you had Primer Gray. When we did shows, we, we drew a lot of people because everybody went to the shows. It wasn't just death rock people. You know, it, was, it was that, it was uh, rockabilly people, it was punks, it was rockers, it was everything. Everybody wanted to come to the shows. And, and that's what I liked about the scene at that time. It seemed very, it seemed really united. And of course, you know, because of the type of music we played. You know, the crowds were crazy. It was, they were wild crowds.
I'm just a retake And I'm glad I got a miss by my lander's spouse With this one, we're past that point, no need to act strategic Nineteen ninety, Bam Bam's pops on the scene. John Bentley, proprietor of Bam Bam's, facing a lot of right wing angst because of his gay bar, decided to go ahead and start doing punk rock shows on his stage, and the floodgates opened. In 1989, the building where I was at working, they sold and moved, and it was a vacant building, so I then picked up the building and opened the Bam Bam. It was from a DJ's perspective that I had opened up the nightclub. It pretty much catered to a gay audience. The police department and the city of Bakersfield had many issues with it, as far as harassment, cops coming through there by the dozen, trying to shut you down for anything they possibly could. We were approached by, uh, actually it was Mark Delion, and he wanted to know if we'd be interested in doing a show there. And I said, you know, what the heck, let's, you know, give it a shot. And we did our first show, and uh, it was very successful. And so we probably went a couple weeks later, and so they also booked another show. And from there, it just progressed, and we started booking every single week was another show and another show. The only time that, like, beat, Included in Bakersfield and be around people who love music. I used to hang out across the street from the cellar at Trayvon's downtown. There was that part of the parking lot where the young kids couldn't get in, but that's where all the kids that were in the new romantic scene it was the gay scene. But it was like I was in the New York new romantic music and uh, more like you know new wave shit, and that's where all those people hung out. And uh, that's where I ran into John Bailey, I think, the first time. And I actually worked for him. I was a bartender a couple nights for him. Once John Bentley got a taste of cash, which he wasn't really making doing this underage, you know, kind of gay, clicky thing, he, he got shoveled money, just shoveled towards him from the punk rock scene, people coming in paying, you know, $5. We tried to keep everything under $5. If there was ever any bad press or notoriety about Bam Bams, the club seemed to change its name. So it went from Bam Bams to Club Mars, The Zoo, Club Odyssey, and with that sometimes came a change of location. It was not unheard of for John to move his club from Bam Bam's downtown. It was a Bam Bam's Southwest Bakersfield by Kmart, Bam Bam's Wild West Shopping Center, Bam Bam's Oildale. Eventually things seemed to calm down when it chose a really good location by the Nile Theater downtown and the Greyhound Station and became known as Empire Coffee House. But it was always the same thing. Raucous punk rock shows and endless techno night after night. I mean, the scene was pretty much dead, but when John started doing shows, it kind of revitalized it. Yeah, almost every weekend, you had bands playing. DI, the Vandals, you know, the, like the Mentors, Final Conflict, you know, Aggression, Ill Repute. A whole bunch of bands would start coming through town, kind of start building the Bakersfield reputation back up. My first show, I didn't know what was going on. I was kind of scared. I was 13 years old. Uh, well, standing outside the mosh pit, biggest mosh pit I ever seen, the only mosh pit I'd ever seen up to that point. Everybody was just getting it. Very intimidating, very overwhelming. And I remember I asked Dustin Puckett, what's it like? Does it hurt? He goes, oh no man, it's great, try it. And he pushed me in. And Dustin Puckett, for as long as I can remember, has always been six foot five. Even back then, at 13 years old, that guy was so tall, he just towered over me. Pushed, shoved me in the mosh pit. Came out. With a twisted nose, bleeding like crazy, fat lip, black eye, and I had never been so fucking happy in my life. <laughs> I found my calling. It was fun to show up at our first show, and there was a line around the corner at Bam Bam's, and all these kids were what I thought there to see the crucified. We did the show, the place went off. Chris, he sprained his wrist getting the RKL skateboard that we threw out to the crowd. Security told us absolutely don't do it, so we, we 
did it anyway. Uh, I think one of our first shows was with the Vandals or something. I'm like, oh my god, like here it is. We're finally playing this huge show, and it was just like overwhelming for a little kid to play with one of the bands that he's been listening to like all of his life. And then now all of a sudden you see all these screaming fucking crazy people out in the fucking crowd, you know? They're like, yeah, come on, let's go. I'm like, oh my God, we're gonna die. But then we started playing the set and it was just, it was a dick. It was crazy though back in the days. Yeah, I talked a lot of shit. shit. I still am crazy, I still talk a lot of shit, but back then it was a lot different. You know, you're young, you really don't have anything to worry about, um, except your lunch money the next day. But it was you're crazy. He would call people out in the audience. Like, hey, what the fuck are you looking at? Yeah, your girlfriend's like my dick and all this stuff. And like, the Acrylics was our first band, my first band, and we started a couple of days before New Year's Eve in 1993. Uh, we got together in somebody's garage a couple of days and decided to throw a party for New Year's Eve, and uh, we wrote eight or nine songs in like four hours and they were all the best songs you've ever heard in your life. Back then our songs were like, you know, let's go make some waffles, <laughs> listen to mom. We had a song called Potty Chair, which was my first song I ever wrote. And, uh, you know, real heady shit, real important fucking metaphysical shit. Um, that was a blast. We got to open for the Queers once. That was rad. We got to open for the Swinging Utters. Uh, AFI, uh, back in the early 90s. It was a great band. I mean, that was, all my friends were in the band and at the shows. And we'd skateboard all day, play shows at night, stay up all night and rage. We had a lot of our crew out there, so it was, we just felt like we were invincible. We'd look out, there'd be different crews from different parts of town that were supporting their bands, and they would show up, we'd be playing with their bands, our crews would show up, their crews would show up, and we just felt like no one can touch us. And if they did, there was always a fight. And it was just exciting. When Melty Gumby formed, I had just come out of a, a serious depression at 17 years old. Oh man, good memories, good group of friends that shows every weekend. We've had so many good bands come through Bakersfield. We've been able to open up for all kinds of amazing bands. always wanted to infiltrate my brother's life because he always seemed like he had so much fun and I wanted to have his fun and he's the best person that I've ever known and so we um, my friends and I would steal his tapes um, when he didn't know it and listen to all this like music that you know that was him It was just like this group of people who were just bored in Bakersfield. There's the only thing you could do is get fucked up, pregnant, or be in music. That was it. There was no really a place when Bam it was like that was the whoa, holy shit, we got some place to go. I had never really even sang in a band. I would play drums, so it was like, Ty, how are you, you know, how are you gonna project this or whatever? And I was I was embarrassed. I was I was not that guy that wanted to be a singer. I was the guy that wanted to just kind of like sit in the back. <laughs> as far as being a front man, I wasn't that guy. I would uh, use these theatrics and bring these in to kind of portray what the song is about. We did shows at Bam Bams and Mars that brought people out, but you know, I noticed right off that we needed something that uh, would would keep people coming back. What is it, what are you gonna do next time? Like, is this involved like uh, babies in jello, uh, uh, setting things on fire? I mean, Bentley would let me do anything, you know? I mean, he's an amazing guy. Uh, it, it, he he let, let me like uh, do a fuck peace, let's kill show. 
You know, I mean, because we had Spike 1000 at that time giving a peace you know, concert. So I wanted to be the guy to say, you know what, I'm gonna do something completely different. They're drawing people. Let's do fuck peace, let's kill. So we did like dummies on upside down peace signs and uh, a big huge portrait of Charles Manson. And, uh, just anything to get a rise out of people. 50 pounds of red jello he had on the stage and I had blue carpeting around the nightclub that he ended up throwing the jello everywhere in that building. And I literally have pulled the carpet out of the building and hosed down the ceilings and the walls of the nightclub to get that red jello out of the nightclub. He destroyed the carpet, he destroyed paint, Everything. We started drawing like at least three to like 600 people at, you know, a night. So we would get, you know, people from all different things like jocks and, and punk rockers and all kinds of skinheads. Uh, uh, we, we were targeted by a lot of folks that, you know, for being like uh, uh, a little bit different, you know, than your average person. I don't know if it was... Our, our belief system actually went into some of our writings of music and things like that. Uh, wrote a song called Ignore Your Race. It's on uh, Fetus, which is on Triple X Records. We ended up one night uh, leaving a, sh a show downtown in well, at, at Mars. And um, uh, a guy proceeded to, to hit me with the World War I Kaiser helmet in the mouth. Broke my jaw. Uh, took my teeth out. Uh, laughing as he's doing it kicking me in the head, um, end up going to jail and serving time for it, whatever else. Um, but it was, it, it's, those are the things that you dealt with in Bakersfield at that time. There was, there was some, a lot of aggression, a lot of hatred uh, along with the music, you know, you would have, uh, bringing together all these different people would bring together good things. I know a lot of people met their significant others at Cradle of Thorns shows, you know what I mean? This was like, uh, and people have said down the road, like, thanks, Ty, you know, for doing it because I met my wife at this show. I was at one of the shows with Sex Art and Cradle of Thorns, actually. We actually, Cradle and <laughs> Cradle had a studio right across the way in one of these buildings, and Sex Art, which was fairly corn, was in this building. And we rotated different nights. I was just trying to figure it out. I'm just remember hanging out with Cradle of Thorns with Ty and Rowan and all became friends with them. I used to watch them at, at Bam Bams all the time and go to LA and just like, that's how I caught the bug. They're always were trying to get there to get the deal. This is the night we're gonna get a deal. I know it. And then I remember Triple X showing up and saying they wanted to give them a deal. I was, I, I lived through all that crazy time. And uh, it was a cool ass time. This like this dark underground music scene. It's like the most coolest, intelligent people in Bakersfield. We were just this tarry title of their family. I remember it. Tamara Slayton. She was the singer that sang along with me, Guy Grove vocals. She uh, was pregnant, and so she decided to step out. So we did a, uh, a record that involved just me singing, which is Download This on Triple X. And, and they actually believed in it. You know, it wasn't, it wasn't goth. It wasn't dark. It was more of like the Beastie Boys, what they said, like Beastie Boys meets like Joy Division. You know, they're like, what is this? You know, why are you... You know, bringing in hip hop. Well, I had, I growing up on the east side, I, I we, there's no way of getting around break dancing in the '80s and and listening to like the Johnson Crew and 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 early hip hop and um, uh, it, so I I actually went back to my roots and started rapping. <laughs> and it, it was taken. Just because of the darkness of the music, we had a record label that believed in us. We were able to do these adventures and travel the United States. Once we started on one tour, other bands would, uh, hey Ty, you want to join? You guys want to be on this tour? And for five years straight, we were maybe home two months at a time. We stayed on the road. Later down the road, I I, I, I was able to play like arenas with Corn and Rob Zombie and that kind of stuff. That was a whole nother level. The, the, the best parts of my life were traveling with my best friends 
in a 15 passenger van with everything we owned in the middle of like places like Chicago in the winter where you got to wear three pairs of socks. Cradle kind of morphed into video drone. We actually were at a point where we had to move out of Bakersfield. We could play shows in Bakersfield and, and we would get people there or we could go to LA and, and move to LA. We made the decision to move to Huntington Beach and uh, she had friends and corn that had moved there. Jonathan Davis and all them were, were great people. They actually like said, hey, here's an apartment complex. Why don't you guys get in here? There was eight of us living in a two bedroom. And uh, the bass player from Corn, Fieldy, Reggie Arvizu, um, he started coming by and hanging out and drinking Coors Light with us and, uh, and basically helped us write our record. That in turn signed to elementary Warner Brothers and then um, make us, give us the opportunity to actually uh, do it quote unquote big, you know, <laughs> it was big. So Cradle of Thorns at this point was enjoying a good level of local success and nationwide success. We'll leave them here for the time being and come back to Ty and the band and their story later. Let's check in with Purdy Spackle and Big Jed, Todd Thompson, and see what sort of waves they were making with the release of their 7-inch 45 EP. <laughs> A controversial new record by a local rock and roll group could have dangerous consequences. That, at least, is the argument being made by the gay community tonight. 23's Lynn Sage caught up with the band Big Jed today and asked them why they recorded a song called Die, Faggot, Die. The record was made in a back bedroom turned studio in the Rosedale area. The four member group, Big Jed, says the song Die Faggot Die is the story of a gay man who was killed for spreading AIDS without telling his partners. The recording, they say, is designed as a social joke. Because faggots are kind of, well, they're like good natured people anyway. They'll understand, I think. Actually, I think. if you listen to the single, you'll know that it's tongue in cheek. I would say that uh, uh, they have absolutely no uh, idea of the sensitivity of the issue and how devastated it has left not only the gay community, but uh, their families, their friends, non-gay people who have uh, either um, contracted or have already died from this. This local member of the gay community has been diagnosed HIV positive. He talked with us on the condition that he not be identified. I can find a number of things funny that are unorthodox, but uh, when it's dealing with an already um, unpopular and perhaps persecuted minority, it no longer carries any, any co uh, concept of humor. Activists for the local gay community say hate crimes against gays have increased 20-fold in just the last few years. They say recordings like this one simply perpetuate fear and, more importantly, they say misunderstanding. But the members of Big Jed say they haven't caused any harm. They never meant to cause any harm. And furthermore, they say we have overestimated their importance. I doubt anyone's going to go out and kill homosexuals because Big Jed said die, die, die. They can be offended or they can laugh with it. I say, uh, listen and use your own brain. Think about what the words you're saying. I'd say that uh, the brain that has created it has not been made much use of. Lynn Sage, 23 News. Out of all the songs Todd had that were all super catchy and great and cool and interesting and neat and whatever, he decided to put out a record of a song called Die, Faggot, Die. This was not one of his best songs. First, it's a rap between two hillbilly characters talking about how you can catch AIDS. And then it goes into a Slayer-esque kind of heavy metal song, which tells a story of a guy who purposely went around infecting people with AIDS. One of the people that got infected hunts him down and kills him. And the last part of the song is just like a little uh, 
super homophobic little, uh, I don't know what you call it, just like refrain. Nobody, especially me, in the band was homophobic in the slightest. Thankfully, a lot of people got the joke. They listened to the words. They knew, okay, these guys are just assholes. There's no, you know, these guys aren't Nazis. They're not really saying, go kill baby. They get it. Some people did not get the joke. And I don't blame them. And they were very angry with us. Um, and a lot of clubs either cancel their shows or refuse to book us. The show was at a club called The Covered Wagon. We show up and there's a huge crowd out front and they're screaming and yelling at us and throwing bottles. You know, they're like, we're gonna fuck you up, blah, blah, blah. So we play our first song with us and it's a song called Big Magnet. And not to brag, but that song is great. We played that song. Right after that song was over, the crowd got quiet. Because they were not expecting us to have good songs. They were expecting us to go up there and just be dicks and just play shitty music. They did not realize how good a band picture it was. Todd decides that he's going to confront these guys. So he makes an announcement from the stage. He said, you guys all showed up here because you think we're homophobes. I will prove to you that I'm not homophobic. I want one of you guys to come up here on stage and I'll suck your dick on stage. Nobody says nothing. He's like, come on pussies. One of you guys come up here, I'll suck your dick. You think I'm homophobic? Check this out. Come on up on stage. Nobody does shit, right? And Todd's like, I'm not playing another note until somebody comes on the stage and whips her dick out. Finally, this guy with a mullet, he came up on stage, whipped it out, and Todd did what he said he was going to do. Afterwards, we continued playing, and we got huge cheers from the crowd. We all know Corn. Uh, uh, within a year, had blown up huge. Maybe two years, had blown up huge. Uh, and I'd watched them and, and watched the entire scene in Bakersfield change, good and bad. One day they were hanging out in Bakersfield. Next day they were on tour, and they just never stopped. Yeah. More power to them, man. They, they, I not mad respect for their hard work and JD's focus and uh, what they've all been through. I've seen the whole thing go down. Uh, right in front of my eyes, and uh, you know, I, I'm still fortunate to this day to uh, be a part of that family. There were a lot of opportunities given to a lot of guys for um, working with the band. Um, guys that I had known and played in other bands with had become their guitar techs and had gone on the road with them to be roadies. I think they did it and they did it right and they paid homage to Bakersfield and they owned it. I think that whenever you're authentic and you own where you're from, even if you're in LA making it and all that kind of stuff, and in Orange County in their case, Huntington Beach, which by the way has a lot of strange connection to Bakersfield, um, but Bakersfield by the bay, um, it, 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 uh, I think you don't lose. I think you keep everyone's hearts. You know, I think Bakersfield, I think they were Bakersfield's heroes, to be honest with you. All of us in the band were from Bakersfield, um, but we transplanted with somewhere else. I was the last one to get in the band. Um, Head, I mean, Head and Fieldy went to school together at Compton Junior High. Um, I didn't know David at all when I was here, and then I, I think I met Monkey once or twice because he was in Rosedale. But I knew, I, I knew Fieldy because we grew up together. His dad and my dad played in bands together, so um, we were all these kids from Baker. So then once I joined the band, I come back. I was I was mostly here because those guys really didn't come back. They only come back to see their parents, and. Uh, I got to that point where I just really hated this place too. <laughs> um, but it always sets you back, and lo and behold, I've been here almost 10 years, I came back almost 10 years ago. Man, they, they just nailed it, Corn nailed it. They were just sticking with their roots, sticking with their group of friends, and they, and they just fucking nailed it. And that, that is, that's, I have to be, I have to thank them for Orgy's success, for sure. Since Corn got signed, everybody was looking at Bakersfield. 
And of course, you kind of emulated that sound a little bit, which, you know, it's it's not a good thing or it's not a bad thing. We did quite a few demos, but that first demo we did was that's more of a punk rock kind of demo. Yeah. And then after that it was, you know, kind of like the corn explosion and the, the okay, hey, there's this, this other sound out there in the world, you know, maybe that's something we want to look into. So then we started kind of moving more into that, that more heavy rock sound after that with more of that funk rock kind of influence to it. Orgy was the product of, of me being so tied to the corn scene in the shadow. How do I break out of that shadow? How do I, how do I break the mold? Um, when everyone had dickies on and dreadlocks and gas station shirts on and that, you know that whole look that and the Adidas and it was so strong. Corn created this entire look and this feeling and this sound. What do I do? I'm one of the Bakersfield people. Everyone in Bakersfield sounds like Corn right now. They just they just they just ordered the scene. Like everyone's lockstep behind them. Some of the scene had now gotten away from that pure punk rock. Um, you know, mentality to this, I gotta make money and we gotta get signed mentality. Swag was kind of, it was all, everyone's love for Melvin's Neurosis, that heavy shit, you know, like when Mark, we had Carbo Lowrider and fucking all that heavy low tune shit, because at that time, punk rock was fucking sugary. It was not fun. It was all woo woo. My girlfriend left me, but we were like, no, nope. you know, it's like that's when I kind of really started going over to like Simple Tour and all that because it was it was err and punk rock. I could not find the err in punk rock anymore, even though I could listen to the old stuff. But anything coming out, man, was just glossy, just not nothing. And the, the kids were just kind of whiny little bitches, and they go in the pit and they fall. You know, it's like. You know, of course you're not going to hurt anybody, but there was a bunch of aggro shit going on. And then it was like, you know, just kind of stand there with your fucking latte and do whatever you got to do. Like, fuck that. We came out down here <clears throat> ready to rip heads off and shit down next because that's what the fuck we did. Swag 667, we were no holds barred, um, and that's the way we came. We, you know, we're Bakersfield, man. Bakersfield fueled low core was our mantra. We came here, we were the neighbor of the beast, man. We may not have been Satan, but we were his neighbor. So we came here, and that's the way we came to every show. I guarantee we blew the doors off of this place because we came to kick ass. That's, that's without a doubt what we came to do. Good, bad, or ugly, we came to kick ass. If you got near the microphone, you got knocked out. That's just the way it was, so that's the way we roll. We signed in 1999 to, to Elementary at Reprise. When you do make it to that level at this point, it, it was record sales. If you didn't go gold or, you know, on your first your first record, you know, there was no, eh, well, we'll give you another one. We stayed on the road. We toured with bands like Machine Head, um, which were completely different than, than our style. You see what I mean? But we would take any tour, filter up. Uh, which was, you know, around the same rooms. This band called Orgy, which had Ryan Shuck. Yeah, as I got older and I started going to Bakersfield to go see bands like Cradle Thorns, and which was a huge influence on me. Um, um, seeing LAPD, which would later become Corn, <laughs> you know, and all this stuff was a huge influence to me. To me, they were rock stars. Like, that was like awesome. They were making cool music. They put out a CD. Holy shit. A compact disc and even tapes before that. So I was just like, to me, I was in awe. We did whatever it took, but it that that once you're in that level, you have to have a single hit. Or we were uh, we actually heard our our song on K Rock, you know, in L A. But it was at like one in the morning, you know what I mean? But it was great. It was like one of those things where look at we've made it big now, you know what I mean? This is great. And uh, but it, it it was a different thing. We did a video. And, release that and that still to this day is uh, does well you know you can still look that up and, and it has Jonathan Davis he actually paid you know out of, out of pocket himself to make that video happen I want to be here watching Ty that guy when he first came in I did my first recording session with him I watched how he did melody lines and shit that kind of like hit me how to figure out what I was gonna sing and stuff like that so I have mad respect for Ty and Rowan my best friend I lived with Rowan for a while um, Chris Coles, all those guys, I, 
we were all family. I was doing things that I uh, always wanted to do. There was I was that guy that wanted to be, uh, okay, well, we're at a, a, a huge venue. I want to make that run from one side of the stage and do a stage dive, even though you, you, to make it across into the audience we took going off the monitor and flipping, you know. Uh, I was told, like, if you do that ever again, you know, you're going to, uh, you guys are off the tour. Video drone was Cradle of Thorns. Cradle Thorns probably made me want to be in a band. There were people in Bakersfield that I could see on the street. I could go to their jobs or whatever. Like, I, I, they're real people that they created this goth, dark, cool album called Remember It Day. And I remember that day vividly. I, I'm surprised that CD doesn't have burn marks in it because I fucking listened to it like it was going out of style. And I was just like, I can't believe that people in Bakersfield are making this like almost like European level, like fucking dark, dark, cool music and sounding like Peter Murphy and all this kind of stuff. So Cradle of, Cradle of Thorns very much ruled the scene. I learned a lot about the business end of this, uh, being in Video Drone, and they, we weren't the best businessmen. We were, we were musicians, artists, uh, and, and stuff like that. We weren't uh, business savvy, uh, and uh, it ended up being the downfall. We, uh, those, those kind of things you have to watch closely. If you're not like making the right decisions, and I, uh, I had an addiction issue, and uh, eventually it caught up to me. There was other bands that were afraid for other members in their bands uh, that were also had addiction issues, and they were we will not allow you to tour with this guy because, you know, there's going to be some problems. So uh, my addictions ended up turning into going to rehab and a lot of things that I, you know, you had to do. Uh, I, sex, drugs, and rock and roll. And I was living it. The end of Video Drone ended up being basically a phone call. There was no, we, we hadn't made back the money that we had spent at this point. Um, and we were spending money to a level that it was, you, you just can't recoup that money in sales. Things were changing, the internet was being brought in. Uh, it was, uh, people were able to download your music and you know, there was changes going on. I received a phone call. Uh, you know, a lot of people think you, you made it big, man. You're, you have all this money and these cars and all this. It wasn't about that. It was actually everything I owned was on the bus or on the, in the van. Yeah. And, uh, uh, <laughs> there was, uh, you, it's sort of like being, we were, we were dropped. You know, I said, you're, you're done, you know, this is done. We're not gonna pick up another record. We became part of the Korn family. Korn turned around and signed Orgy to Elementary Records, which is a subdivision of Warner Brothers and Reprise. So, fucking our fucking friends turned back around and signed us to our first major label deal. I got all these calls from Roadrunner Records, from CBS, you name it, and, and really what they were looking for and it was an eye-opener for me. They weren't looking for a band. They were looking for a babysitter. They wanted somebody who could take all these little projects that we had here in Bakersfield and put together something for the A&R guys so it looked all pretty. And I'll tell you what, if that wasn't the most freaking fuck you shit I'd ever heard from, uh, it went against every piece of what I know about fucking music, man. Fuck you, you corporate rating bastards. But it was, it was crushing to me because I know that we all want to make it. I know that we want to get money. I know that we want to be successful and success is oftentimes, you know, related to money. Uh, and, but it was awful for me because it, it, it began the end. I, you know, I lost a lot of love in, in what I was doing. It's Bakersfield. There's always haters in Bakersfield. It's always drama in Bakersfield. You can't go anywhere on Bakersfield with fist fights or some bullshit going on. Bakersfield just took over music. Holy shit.
I fucking love music. Music is, music is universal. It's literally the thing that translates no matter what language. You can feel the vibrations, like you, you get the sense of what they're trying to talk about. Even if it's just music alone, like you can, you get a sense of what they're feeling when they're writing this music. By the mid 90s to the late 90s, many different promoters and bands started doing shows at a pizza restaurant at 19th and Chester Avenue, right in the dead center, the heart of downtown. Jerry's Pizza. It was wild, it was crazy, it was nuts. It was pictures of beer flying everywhere and lots of nights that were unforgettable. Depending on what time frame you're in, you were either upstairs Jerry's or downstairs Jerry's. And downstairs Jerry's is a very gritty, subterranean um, kind of a feel. You know, it's, it's dark, there's no windows, uh, it's, it's brick lined, it's a long hallway. And upstairs is kind of a long hallway too, and, and they kind of share those similarities. But um, downstairs, I always felt it was kind of a, a more of a special place. I first started going to shows in the Bakersfield music scene when I was 15, so that would have been a, right around 2000, 2001. And I primarily was coming to Jerry's Pizza starting out when I'd go to them about every weekend. It was crazy. The, the, the room, there was always a circle pit. And I remember thinking it was like a combination of like NASCAR and football. <laughs> you had to run around in a circle, you know, and. It was aggressive, but nobody was really trying to hurt each other for the most part. All these kids that would like uh, go in a circle and, f and uh, fight, <laughs> run around and hit each other. At that time, I would say that Jerry's Pizza was kind of the epicenter of, of the scene. You know, it, it, it was where you went to go see shows. Definitely, there was good atmosphere and demand for the place. To, to play, everybody was trying. I, I always believed, I always believed that, that when you are becoming a little musician, even what they call him coming from the garage band, and you showing out on the stage, and you able to sing to the microphone and, and appear a little bit, jump to the high ceiling. No, we don't have a high, but jump as far as you can in front of the audience. There is already something, something which is learning process, not like many people were saying that this is a bunch of idiots playing, like, uh, cruising around Jerry's Pizza on the inside. This is not the truth. Any music, if that, we are fill up the demand for the Beckers fill at that time. It was huge demand for the, for the heavy metal of punk rock music and all this stuff, and everybody wanted to, to play here. And among good people there, Will was coming, all the riffraff, which I did like it or don't like it, but I like because they were here, they were happy. For me, most important, I didn't select the music for good and bad. All the music was good if people were coming and listening and participating in this activity. There was always a lot of people bleeding. <laughs> yeah, concussions. Yeah, people getting hurt. Come on. Was... What? You got a dislocated knee? Was that Steven or something like that? Um, Crazy night. Uh, Try to get that one guy there, you all know, Roy. Yeah. Roy still hasn't got a girlfriend. Yeah. He wants one real bad. Yeah. So he wanted us to make a song for him that helped him get a girlfriend. And this song's called Roy Scarazzo.
there are all kinds of shows. We had the good shows, bad shows, big crowd shows when the <coughs> fire department wanted to shut us down. Crosswalks for show. It was right upstairs from here. And it was, I've got the flyer over that. I think it was 95, the summer of 95 maybe. And it was with a band called The Fuzz and The Acrylics. And I was, that was one of, looking back, like one of the most single uh, nerve wracking times in my entire life because outside of like, you know, school band, I had never played drums in front of more than like four or five people. So there was a lot of people at that show and getting on stage and you know setting up and everything I still remember the anxiety but once it started it was just I absolutely loved it and I, I just I wanted to do that all the time after that. Dim was a, a kind of like a pop goth band it was me Keith Lawson on bass um, Jason Montez Chocolate Horse on rhythm guitar Miss Ross on uh, on vocals and Ramon uh, Brahas on lead guitar and uh, we, this is probably the best band I was ever in. We just really got along. We were like a family. Everyone was just happy to hang out together and we hang out at Jerry's a lot. Right after work, I walk downtown and you see 19th and 9th Street just packed up. All four corners would be packed up with people. Just sitting, drinking, smoking, you know, waiting for the show to go on. That was great. That was fun. For me, it was the energy, man. Like the uh, the local shows. It's like every weekend or every Friday, Saturday, you'd go and see like half your classmates or even people you know you went to high school with or whatever. I mean, it was all just like a big group that we all just kind of stuck together. I mean, ultimately, we're all here because we all like the same type of music. I mean, I've I've met some of the greatest people, some of the greatest people I could consider family members to me uh, because of music. I mean, honestly, that's, that's, that's empowering as it is. The lead singer of the Dabblers was Dick Dabbler. He was not a tall guy by any stretch of the imagination. About five foot four with boots on. But this guy was very intelligent, extremely well read and a gentleman and pretty crafty. He handmade his own body armor with spikes so seeing this guy come at you like a spark plug in the pit was a, uh, a matter of danger you got out of the way when you saw Dick Dabbler on stage with his handmade crafted armor for me it was all about the local bands a lot more 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 so I always liked the local scene it was always really active it was it was fun it was wild you know some of my favorite bands were active ingredients dabblers uh, the family, Riot Kids, those were some good times. Sure, the big shows were great too. Gutter Matthew Brigade, uh, Toxic Nakara came out, uh, Quincy Punks, uh, Conflict, GBH. Uh, There's so many good live shows. It was just insane. Do a cattle decapitation. The Riot Kids, we were a Hardcore racial punk band. We started in the late late 90s, 98, and then uh, throughout maybe 2002, I believe, 2001, we played hardcore punk rock as raw as you can get. I got to open up for TSOL, Youth Brigade, the Mosh Pits were crazy. I've had some of the best shows I've ever played here. My band, the Right Kids, growing up, and we were Jerry's kids. At the end of the 20th century, year 2000, Jerry's was housed to a many different genres and styles of bands touring all over the United States, all over, all over the world would come here and play. It was a perfect location, Bakersfield being halfway between Los Angeles and San Francisco. It was a ready stop for bands. Any day of the week, Jerry's was available, and it was a, a hungry crowd. Had its limitations. I mean, the capacity was uh, was very modest, and it was always packed to the gills. So when touring bands that were bigger than Jerry's, we had to go back to Salamores, just like in the 1980s, the little venue over there on, on uh, Baker Street that Mark discovered back in the 80s, and they were always let us do shows there. 1999, noise rock legends Fugazi came to Bakersfield to play 
the show was held at the Salon Juarez Dance Hall. Pretty cool note is the fact the band actually requested that a local Bakersfield female pop band called the Pop Rockets get to open the show, which is pretty cool when legends like Fugazi are actually requesting your band to open the show, and very classy move indeed. Most music, and certainly punk rock as well, or underground or hardcore, whatever you want to call it, is well represented by white boys playing music. So when we would, we always would say like, we got the four white dudes with guitars and bass and drums, we got that covered, let's get some other people on stage. And I think we were always just looking for bands that are not just, also there's a lot of bands that kind of sounded like us, who were inspired by us, and it's, a, it's a weird to have them opening for us. We tried to mix it up. You know, we want to have different ideas on stage. Um, but I didn't think someone just said they were a good band. I think for most girls, it's, back then especially, it was it was rough, you know? I see a lot more females in the punk scene now than I did back then. Would you agree when you go to a show? 100%. Oh yeah. Chicks crazy. are hard to find, especially punk rock chicks. It's yeah. super hard to find. But nowadays, man, yeah. they're blowing up. There's a lot of females yeah. out there. I think they master the pit now. <laughs> Salon Juarez eventually kicked us the fuck out of their venue and said no more shows when we did Insane Clown Posse, 440 screaming juggalos from Oildale and uh, all over Bakersfield showed up with clown face paint to watch Insane Clown Posse play on a school night and the ceiling tiles were covered with Fago root beer and see, uh, the ceiling fan snapped in half and we lost our deposit and the lady said, well, I think that'll be the last show. Thanks a lot for coming. In the year 2000, the band Weezer got back together and were doing a series of festival dates all across the United States and they needed a tune-up gig. And they came and approached Jerry's Pizza and said, hey, we want to do a practice gig here. The crowd was all the way out the fucking door. You're trying to walk in, and it, I swear to God, I came downstairs and thought I was going to pass out. It was so fucking hot in here from all the bodies and the body warmth. It had to have been like a 150 degrees in this place. Think of like the hottest, stinkiest ass you could ever smell with Weezer playing <laughs> in the background. And it's not the radio, it's really Weezer. So you're like, fuck yeah, this is awesome, but goddamn, it smells like shit in here. Ladies and gentlemen, give it up one time for Lord Records recording artist that's here for Trackster! Through the 1980s, I was in a, in a metal band. That was a Christian metal band. Uh, we played a number of places in, in Bakersfield, but there was never a venue in town up until Bam Bam started that we could actually play at, that actually had its own sound system. And so I came out of that perspective of uh, wanting to put on a, have a venue to where bands could be able to play and actually learn how to uh, have sound checks, know how to work with the monitor system, uh, and actually have a, a good sized stage to where they could actually perform instead of being crammed really close together. We had a nice uh, 48 channel Mackie board. We had our full on EV sound system speakers with uh, four monitor mixes up on the stage. And then we had lighting, you know, to make it look like a rock show. Had the smoke machine to where we could make it look like, you know, uh, something big. Our clientele was really towards local musicians more than it was for the traveling bands. We wanted to have the local bands feel like uh, they were at a rock show. Not only that, because it was all ages, there was a lot of high school kids back in those days. I mean, that's when the Lebecs were around. They were in high school. Fat Chance was in high school. Dublin Panic, they were in high school, you know. We wanted them to be able to come in and have a, have a good environment to where they could bring their families. So a lot of their moms and dads came out to the shows. The parents invited them out. And, and, uh, and it was a big family affair, really, and it was just a good, positive experience. One of the motives of doing the gate was that my kids were with me, like, you know, because they grew up in the music scene with me, playing in a band, and then uh, they got into music, and so, you know, it was just a way for me to be with my kids, putting on shows they would get excited about. Uh, the Lebecs were, in, in my view, a bunch of young guys in school, and they had a natural draw from uh, the high school crowd. 
especially with the girls. A lot of shows would just have guys showing up because they like to watch the, you know, have the loud music. But the girls not only like the songs, but they like the guys in the bands. I started getting involved in the music scene. It was a lot of skate rock, the acrylics, different bands, Joy Toy, uh, Melted Gumby, Active Ingredients, and I really enjoyed just the energy behind it. I liked a lot of harder stuff, heavy metal and things like that. We ultimately just decided on a, a sound of pop. pop and I think at the rock. time, there was a lot of you know, hardcore bands. It was a real hardcore scene. And I, I personally wasn't into the hardcore music by that point. The, the poppy skate rock was really what drew me in. And uh, so when I was ready to start playing, I think for me it was, uh, I, I just, I enjoyed the East Bay pop scene, you know, the, the Green Day, Mr. T Experience, just that whole All the Lookout Records. Yeah, the Lookout roster. Records. Yeah, and I was really into that. <laughs> Well, I was in a really crappy band, actually. We uh, played here at Jerry's Pizza, and Kyle was running the PA at the time, and I don't know what he saw in me, I guess you could say, uh, but as soon as I was done playing, he was just like, hey man, straight up, you want to play in a real band? Because uh, <laughs> this band, I mean, you, they're good and all, but you need to come play with me. We discovered metal and hardcore and screamo and punk rock and what well, didn't discover it but we decided that we wanted to right. expand our hardcore, horizon yeah the hardcore kind of broke out as we were getting like bigger sounding like the get up kids all of a sudden we were pushed to the back because all the hardcore music came out and uh, it was either you know you I kinda, wasn't pushed to the back no you know just, what I'm saying it we're was just like we started liking different stuff and like right, let's right. throw it all in the mixing bowl and see what happens and that's that's how that, yeah, that's what happened. <laughs> sort of wanted to look like Molly Crew. Yeah. <laughs> and act definitely. like Molly Crew. Yeah, and, yeah, that definitely happened. Played the Warp Tour. Yeah, the Warp Tour was cool. In Fresno. Was definitely cool. I mean, we played Seos and Slow Groove. Was a cool Seos, show. well, we did a couple shows. With yeah, them, and then we were blessed. We had somebody backing us up. The first time I saw Stereo Technic before I joined the band was that would have been in 2004. I was in a band uh, called The Crime with Steven Allison. Uh, Rob booked The Gate, Vendetta Red played, we opened up for Stereo Tactic, and Stereo Tactic opened up for Vendetta Red. And that was the first time I ever saw him. Chris Hunter was playing guitar at that point, and I never would have thought that I would have eventually been in that band, because they, they were all older than me. They're like the big boys, and The Crime was like my first band I ever really gigged in, you know, so it was, it was pretty cool. Learned a lot of the riffs by ear, a lot of them, I remember. They auditioned other guitar players that didn't even really put any effort, would show up and didn't. So basically I did some work, and they really liked that. And I, as of course, got along with the guys. I would practice the songs hard, and they just figure, well, this guy at least shows up. <laughs> you know what I mean? He makes an initiative to learn the songs, and that's how it started. Kyle, I remember specifically asking you, do you have any problem wearing makeup? When I, that night I hung out with him before I actually jammed with him, and I said, no, no, man, I don't. And then, uh, was really, I was, I was lying because I wanted to be in the band. And uh, long story short, they never got me to wear makeup, and they were, they were, they were upset about that at that time. That was a long time ago, you know, everybody was younger and all that kind of stuff, but. I never actually wore it, and if I actually was just showing my buddy the other day, I have a Stereo Tactic poster on my wall, and uh, all three of them got makeup, and I'm sitting there in an Aerosmith t-shirt, and they have no makeup on, you know what I mean? It's, it's funny now, you know what I mean? At the time, that was the, uh, that was the mojo, you know, the scene, whatever was going on, you know? I specifically remember once we played in Hanford, and they didn't have anything in Hanford. We played in a church, and we roll up in a van, and my dad would let us borrow his trailer to put our gear in it, and they thought that was so cool. And so we roll up and you know, most of the band has makeup on and a trailer and all this stuff and they thought it was just the coolest thing ever. And uh, we played and there, all the kids in Hanford thought we were rock stars or something little did they know. And I remember even like signing autographs. It was so weird. I was 20 years old and like we were nobody, nothing. You know what I mean? They were a good band. And we, it was Kyle and all those guys did that for a long time. They worked really hard at it. You know, and I got to kind of jump in and enjoy those experiences, you know. You, if you spend a day in Bakersfield, you know, you go up to Tehachapi, it's, you're able to breathe, put it that way. You, you, don't, you don't see what you're breathing in, you just see clear skies. It's a breath of fresh air, that's the best way to put it. Tehachapi's just a safe, small town up in the mountains. Some people know about it, a lot of people don't. 
you know, it's not a big city, so it's a good place to raise your kids. It's 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 good th it's a good place to do all the all the boring stuff that you know a family man might do. The kids and Tashby even even before Dyer did and, and that whole hardcore thing that happened. I remember as a kid coming down here, we'd come down here skateboarding with my buddies, and then I remember there'd be, oh, so and so's band's playing at Jerry's Pizza or wherever. We'd come out here to support them just because one of our friends was in the band. Kids in Tashby were thirsty for something to do. Yeah. yeah. You know what I mean? Something other than to get into trouble. So, like, you know, it could be a little house party, a couple, a couple bands playing, and everyone will show up. You know what I mean? Your friends are playing, there's nothing else to do. You go have some fun. So to us, hardcore was about friendship. And I guess unity is pretty cheesy, but that, that was what Die Hard Youth was. It was cheesy, like friendship, unity, brotherhood. We didn't care if you were a straight edge, if you were, you know, what color you were, or, you know, who you wanted to pray to, who you wanted to go home with that night. We didn't care, you know, who you wanted to sleep with, or all that didn't matter. What style of music you really loved. We were all friends. I mean, we got friends that were all walks of life. We started a band, and we just wanted to do a band that, like, was kind of all inclusive. Um, some members of the Die Hard Youth at the time. Uh, we were never like a fully straight edge band, but like we did have that message. And so just we started playing house shows with whoever we could in Tashby. We didn't have to play instruments, we just jumped around and like made fools of ourselves and just trying to be super aggro. Nine, Munoz Gym was my grandpa's boxing gym. So it was an actual boxing gym um, in the 60s where he would bring fighters down, uh, a lot of them from Mexico, some from around the neighborhood, and he would train them to fight, train them to box. We have a, it went into a uh, egg business, which my grandparents ran, and they would sell eggs out of there. It was a chicken shack at one time, so it was a very square building, uh, small, it's fairly small, I don't know how big it was. At one point it did have a ring, which was later broken, but the majority of the time before we ruined it, it was an actual boxing gym. What I focused on was DIY punk. No matter what kind of punk it was, anything that was just not normal. You know, obscure things, up and coming bands is what I was into. So a lot of those times, you know, we'd call them on the phone and have them come play to nobody most of the time for the early years. But sometimes we did fun. Well, people that came to the gym we're always pretty close. We never, I think the whole time, almost 20 years, we had two fights, uh, which is insane. Just think about a punk rock venue having literally two fights over that amount of time. Uh, you came there because you wanted to see the show or you wanted to hang out with your friends. Well, Death Valley Driver started out as a wrestling band. We play five, six power band songs about wrestling. And then Adam at the time put down his base, beat the shit out of me, Adam Harrell. We'd do a whole wrestling match inside there with fire and... At the gym. Gym here, we done it here. Um, we did it in Fresno. Catching fire, uh, bleeding all over the place. Razor blades. I was also in another band called The Repugnance, which was a, a traditional skinhead boy band. I was the only shark in the band, which caused a lot of issues, um, but it was an oi band, it was street punk stuff, we were writing our own stuff, and there was a few covers of like Combat 84 and Last Resort. Uh, it, it was, it, those were wild times, man. I mean, being a skinhead in Bakersfield, it wasn't a joke. We still had Nazis. You had to fight for your spot downtown, and guaranteed every weekend there was a fight. And it wasn't always clean fights. <laughs> you know, if people got stabbed, people got killed, and that was, that's a part of it. I was contacted by one of our other skinhead crew guys and they were doing a band called the Soul Steppers at the time and they had just played a few shows and it was traditional old skinhead reggae style stuff which I, I leaned more towards that in liking music as opposed to playing oi music. But I really just wanted to play anything. But the Soul Steppers were the first band that I heard and I was like wow I would love to be in that fucking band. I would do anything to be in that fucking band. 
because they were good, they were getting big shows, they were already getting records. So I joined that band and that was another wild time. We did a lot of big things and we actually made it famous in Europe, kind of like Hasselhoff, but nobody could have given less of a fuck in the US. Jerry's Pizza was my awakening. This is where I'm welcome, finally. I'm here, I've arrived. Some place where I'm accepted for me. No, try being a black, a weird black guy in Bakersfield when black people don't even like you for being you. It sucks, it's a drag, man. You find a home and you stick with it. You find people that love you and accept you for you are. You go where you're tolerated, not celebrated. You go where you're celebrated, not tolerated. That's where I wanna be at, and that's what this place is to me. About to have a solidary tear. <laughs> I'm about to, I'm about to, I'm about to tear about here, man. was like Peter Murphy fronting Jane's Addiction. It was bringing together another diverse group of people. Uh, me being like from uh, coming out of Video Drone, which was more of like an industrial kind of like metal thing. And Mike Montano being in the band, you're bringing in some punk rock, some funk. You got Cesario Grasso, which is like the baddest drummer in Bakersfield, I believe to this day. Any style you get the guy. We, uh, we're all listening to different stuff. Alex Garza, which is the DJ in the band that started, pretty much helped start the band. He comes from like hip hop and that kind of stuff. But we never really, uh, we actually did a rock version of it, you know? It, was, it, was, it wasn't metal, it wasn't, it wasn't rock, it was this, uh, and it was listenable for all people. Like, it was that was the band I could give to people, like, say, my mom or my grandma, and go, Look what I'm doing. And they go, oh, This is great, I mean, this is listenable. I ended up playing with Ty Elam, who was probably one of the biggest architects of the underground, Bakersfield Underground um, music scene from the 90s. In the beginning of that band felt like the beginning of Cradle Thorns. You got Cesario and Jim Fendrick and Mike and, and Alex, and it's like the jams. We played a 45 to an hour, 45 minutes to an hour set, and I would be drenched from head to toe in sweat, and it felt like I'd play for four hours. Because, you know how everybody talks, you know, that old cliche of, we gave it up, we gave it out on the stage. It wasn't even, it wasn't even that. It was the fact that it was just so draining and so exhausting. Hitting those drums so hard. I'm feeling it now. But it was, it was one of those things where we all believed in what we were doing 100%. The majority of Karma Hitless has absolutely no cussing, no foul language, nothing. It was a way of expressing myself without going to that side you know what i mean it was uh, these are true feelings there was more uh, it wasn't like trying to uh you know like in and say we started with cradle thorns where i was trying to make people feel uncomfortable this was i was finally comfortable you know and singing and being a, a front man and singing in the band it was great it was, you had different ethnicities of people which brought their styles and it was just it was it reminded me of living in, you know, where I grew up.
Cosby is, was one of the creators of the, I mean, they, they, they say the Bakersfield sound. He is the Bakersfield sound for, like, originality, you know, and creating something that was, now people are just catching on to. And that was 25 years ago. He wrote country songs. He had a song, Big Magnet, about Bakersfield, no matter how much you try to leave, it always drags you back. It was beautiful. It's a beautiful, beautiful song, but with a country rock feel to it. Have you ever had a friend that just knew every obscure reference that you had? Knew every TV show you saw as a kid and could describe it in detail? Just, you never had to explain yourself to, you never had to say you're sorry. He just... come a long way through four decades of music in Bakersfield, California, and a lot of our characters have grown roots here. What are they up to today? What are they doing? I started playing country music, and now I play stand-up bass in an outlaw country music bankerful band called the Iron Outlaws. I had an idea in my head. I was in love with this band called um, Flogging Molly at the time. And this is a Celtic, traditional Celtic band that um, added punk influence into it and fused it. And they were like this Irish like punk band. And they had a lot of instruments. It was like fiddles, accordions, banjos. Um, they just had this full stage of like players. And I just thought it was awesome how they all would come in and do solos and they just rock it. And um, the idea was kind of to be like that kind of idea but with a bigger sort of country sound and the punk infusion. These are all the bands that Cesario has been in throughout his musical career. Probably be a bit easier if we would have listed all the bands he hasn't been in. But that's another issue. I'm basically trying to play as much as possible and which is the promise that was granted to me from all those years back in 1990 when I played my first gig at Bam Bam. Dive Today for me is like uh, lots of growing. I'm in, I'm in the cannabis industry. I kind of spreader to get assist. Right now, most of the time I'm spending on the ranch. I have cows, horses, dogs, uh, over 2,000 squirrels, a few rattlesnakes. It all belong to me this time. Here, I'm inspired the most by here because I can just look out the fucking front door. I'm in Oildale, California, and I will always see something that will inspire me. There are some weird motherfuckers here, bro. <laughs> and I love it. It just fuels my fucking creativity. These days, you know, you find me uh, at home, married, I got kids, you know. Still punk as fuck. Punk rock dad, uh, husband. Uh, I, my career has totally evolved and more. I'd sing a lot of weddings and, uh, uh, you know. Stuff like that. 2008, I decided to run for mayor of Bakersfield. Um, 
so a lot of homeless and then now we don't have places for people with mental disabilities to go anymore. You can't really just grab them up and force them to get help. They're just, if they want help, but we, most of us know if, if you have those kind of problems, you don't, you know, search out help. You, you, you deny that you need help. And homeless, so I kept, you know, doing like homeless feeds next to my shop and, and things like that. So I wanted to make a difference in this town where I ran for mayor of Bakersfield. And I, I uh, got laughed at a lot, got attacked. You know, by people, and the first time I went and ran, I ran against the mayor incumbent, Harvey Hall. She was a great mayor, and I kept my, my campaign positive. I said, no, I'm just concentrating on the homeless. And, and it was funny, because you have to release your phone number. And I'd get calls all the time. What are you going to do about these potholes? Oh, ma'am, where, where are you at? Oh, well, I live in Oildale. Well, unfortunately, that's county, and so I'm not going to do anything about those potholes. After the band Burning Image broke up, Mawadami worked as a member of society with a productive job, quiet and humbly, until a chance meeting between himself and Jello Biafra of Alternative Tentacles Records. Alternative Tentacles at that time was one of the preeminent punk rock record labels and underground music labels with tremendous reach all over the world. So we'll pick up the story right there. Jello was going to be at the Echo in LA doing uh, spoken word. So we uh, we said let's let's go see him. You know, we haven't seen him in a long time. Let's just go see him. So when I got there, you know, I Joe saw me and he says, "Hey, the first thing he asked me was, do you have do you have any more Burning Image music?" He goes, "All I have is this old cassette that uh, one of you guys gave me many years ago." He goes, "But that's all I have." And I told him, I said. I, I have everything. I, I have all the masters. I have everything we've ever recorded. You know, I, I think I might have asked him, well, you know, if you want all this stuff, you know, would you be willing to put this out on alternative tentacles? And he's, he seemed to think it was a, a good idea. When we went our separate ways in 87, uh, I, I pretty much thought, I thought, that's it, we're done. You know, there's, and, uh, I, I think I've mentioned this before to people that I, I think what bothered me the most about going our separate ways was you know, it wasn't the rock star trappings all that crap, you know. It was the, the fact that it felt like my, my megaphone to say what I had to say was taken away from me. When he said that he wanted to put out the, uh, this collection of our music, Burning Image at that time was relatively a, a footnote, you know, uh, in, in in death rock history, I guess. And we were just kind of considered an obscure, an obscure band. And uh, but because of Jello's interest and the mass distribution that Alternative Tentacles has, it really put our name out there. When Melted Gumby ended, it was right around when I graduated high school, uh, 1994. And that's when I started doing the firefighting for the Bureau of Land Management. I worked on what's called the Hotshot Crew and also a helicopter crew. The firefighting thing lasted as, about as, for about eight years. and uh, I went through some troubles of, you know, living with bipolar disorder and it's been a rough, long journey, but um, music is a coping skill for me. It, it's brought, it's, music has brought me out of a lot of uh, dark places. And um, it's been, um, well, it's been therapeutic for me to write lyrics about depression, recovery, um, you know, just life. Life today is uh, family. Uh, and I still love music, I still play music, I still write. I'm a, I, I started as a writer, so I still write lyrics. I still write my emotions down in journals and things like that. Uh, so many journals that I basically put some of them in storage. You know, I write on a daily basis. If uh, And some of it comes like, 
all at one time, and then, you know, and then uh, like two months or four months ago, and I won't, and uh, lately I've been writing again, and uh, I'd really like to play music again, and I'm thinking like, soon. Todd Thompson arranged, recorded, and played all the instruments on a song that he sent to his friend Purdy Spackle on Christmas Day. Here it is. Oh, 
goes something like this. Stay. 